How Lime Harlan Works. That's a brave title, isn't it? I hope I can do this humble, understated wonder material some justice here. First, to address the elephant in the room, by way of explanation, old rugby injury I've recently had sorted. Um, there's never a convenient time to be without one of your arms for six weeks or so. We, um, we had a cartoonist in the office the other day and he was doing caricatures and he asked me what I did. And now cartoonists are um, they're about as non-technical as you can get, but uh, I think he's done an alright job here. So, you know, either take from this, or well, look. I'm good at keeping old bridges and buildings standing up that are trying to fall down, or I'm a troll hiding under a bridge, so um, make it that way you like. Now, as a quick overview of the presentation, I'm going to start by setting the scene with some definitions. Look, what is Hal and what, what are we dealing with here? Then I'm going to boggle your mind with five fun facts about Harlan. I'm going to leave you dangling on the hook for a whole 30 seconds until we grapple with each of them individually and explain it away how it works. Okay. Then, now, uh, understanding how Harlan works is all good and well, but it's a bit of an academic point unless we can bring that information to bear in a specification context. So we'll then look at what gives Harlan its functionality and uh, look at how we can specify to maintain that functionality. Then I'm going to sum up and I'm going to leave you with some light nighttime reading, some references that you can dig into a wee bit deeper, okay? Okay, so what's Harlan? Harlan is a mortar that's hurled, harled at a wall. It's one and the same as the thing as the bedding mortar, possibly mixed, mixed a bit thinner. Of the order of 10 mil thick, sometimes considerably thinner, sometimes considerably thicker, and more often than not, finished in a good hot mixed thick lime wash, um, which, you know, of measurable thickness of the order of, you know, several mil thick. Now, it's an aesthetic finish, it looks the part, but first and foremost, it's always been to keep buildings dry. Now, if you take nothing else home with you other than this angry wee granny teacher, um, I'll be a happy man. Um, breathability is not measured by vapour permeability. That's a terrible way of describing how old buildings work um, in terms of the functional behaviour of the fabric. Um, so I'm banging the drum here because I'm, you know, it just doesn't seem to be getting through. So breathability not via permeability. Okay. So, five fun facts about Harlan. Fact number one, masonry when harrowed dries more efficiently than the same substrate without Harlan. So you're, you're looking at a two foot thick wall, soaking wet, and be an extra 10 mil thick mortar on the outside of it, you know, you're high and dry. What's going on here? Fact number two, a lime harrowed surface dries faster than an open body of water under the same environmental conditions. What are you serious? Fact number three. Not only does harlan help dry the mason out, it keeps it drier for longer during periods of wind driven rain. What's going on here? Fact number four. Lime washed surfaces, and that includes harrowed surfaces, dry more effectively than the same substrate without lime wash. The mind boggles. Fact number five. Whether Harold lime washed or Harold and lime washed, traditional hot mix lime finishes are grappling with moisture in old masonry and in doing so, sacrificially protecting them. All right, David, come on, some answers now, please. How it works. Masonry when Harold dries more efficiently than the same substrate without Harlan. OK, let's probe this a wee bit. So. We've got a two foot thick wall. Um, the, the traditional example is a wall that had the original um, lime surface finishes is then removed to expose the bare masonry and lo and behold, soaking wet. Um, reapply that original harlan and okay, you've made the wall a bit thicker, but you're not going to tell me an extra 10 mil 
on a two foot thick wall is the difference between wet and dry why not just build it that wee bit thicker so um, it's not by thickening the wall that this is working okay well the lime harlan's vapor permeable well hold on a minute surely the most vapor permeable scenario is thin air you're not going to tell me the lime harlan's more breathable than thin air um, so it can't be the vapor permeability the it's the heart of the ability of lime harlan to dry the masonry fabric out is its capillary activity okay now to prove this we first need to set down some physical principles and behind the drying of porous materials okay now so the we've got two idealized cross sections through a porous material the on the left hand side so this is without a drying front at the moment so just spontaneous natural water distribution the gray bit is the solid phase the white bit is the pore and the blue bit is the water now some physical principles water molecules adhere to the walls the pore walls of wettable solids okay um so that's molecular adhesion water molecules also self-cohere so that's it's kind of like they're self-magnetic so if you imagine like we magnetic marbles that stick together but also stick to wettable solid surfaces so you add these two physical principles together and chuck a bucket of water on a bit of dry sandstone and what it does is the water will try and wet as much available internal surface of the pore walls to to wet as much wettable solid as it can whilst also maintaining self coherence the outworking of that is um the water creates a film across the available pore area now at high moisture contents that's a thick film and yes some pores completely fill um come completely with water but at low moisture contents, the, th the film becomes thinner. But as far as it can, it maintains interconnected. So you end up with this interconnected 3D web throughout the porous matrix. Okay. Add a drying front to that, like we've got over on the right hand side. And what you're doing is the, the drying of wet stuff is principally driven by wind speed, speed across the surface. So the, this evaporation front is physically ripping away water molecules at the evaporation front so they're mechanically removed and that opens up a wee bit of space of wettable surface um, at the drying front so the next magnetic marble if you want the water molecule the next guy in the queue bumps forward to wet that free um, surface area and because he's self-coherent to his pal behind him he pulls them along and essentially the whole chain starts to move so you get a capillary flow towards the drying front and as more and more mass is removed the film becomes thinner and thinner okay this is the heart of the capillary drying regime it's a very efficient way of getting water out of stuff okay so water more moisture moves through porous building fabric in the liquid phase not in the vapor phase let's examine the vapor phase a bit further okay vapor phase so what we've done here is we've probed an even finer cross section on just a conjectural bore um so very much idealized for clarity but you get the point so on the left hand side we've got the inside of the building and on the right hand side it's open space on the outdoors okay now water vapor moves through diffusion okay and diffusion is driven by a concentration gradient so that's inside you've got a high relative humidity on the outside you've got very low heat relative humidity so across that barrier either wall you have a gradient that the you know the two gases try and equalize um over a over a period of time now a global imperative to diffuse there may be but locally there is not the 
the relative humidity within the pores of wet porous materials is practically 100%. So there is locally no imperative for the water vapour molecules to diffuse through in the vapour phase. Rather, the, it pays for the water vapour molecules to adhere to the walls of the porous solid and join that film that then scoot through in the liquid phase towards the drying front, drawn through by that advective process that we examined in the previous slide. Okay, now that's a very fast, very efficient for getting mass out of the porous fabric. The other thing with um, water vapour is as soon as a, a, the molecule of the gas bumps into a pore wall, and remember pores are not as idealised as this, they're very tortuous, very twisted, it's you know essentially a certainty that the, the the molecule of a gas will bump into the wall at some point and add here um, and then move through in the liquid phase so the whole idea of water vapor just blowing through the wall is manifest nonsense masonry wouldn't be a very good walling material if the wind could flee, freely blow through so let's just abandon this idea of vapor permeability okay it's terrible just you know how um wet stuff dies okay now i like to have the analogy of the lime joints uh the lime jointing mortar and especially the lime harlan being essentially a conveyor belt to shift the water mass out of the damp fabric towards a drying front the factory door is essentially the access to favourable evaporation conditions. So the wider the factory door, the more stock you can get out and the conveyor belt speeds right up. Um, so that's the sort of wee analogy that I like to, um, to use for uh, thinking about this. Okay. Now, click number two. Um, hopefully we've seen that um, water vapour is not the mode of moisture transport for the drying of damp masonry. Now, this is um, best demonstrated by this mind-boggling fact in number two. So, a lime harrowed surface dries faster than an open body of water under the same environmental conditions. That sounds like it's made up. It's not, right? So, the principal driver of wet stuff in the real world is wind blowing across its surface. And that wind physically removes it, like wisps away the water molecules at at the drying pond. Now the so the the in the context of an open body of water, the drying front area is the plan area. Okay, if you can make that plan area three D you can massively increase the total surface area, i.e. the total access to the drying front. That's you sliding those factory doors right open and the conveyor belt can speed right up to um, maximise, make expeditious use of favourable evaporation conditions when they arise. So that is essentially how a lime harrowed surface dries. It's better at getting rid of water um, molecules than an open body of water. So it kind of kicks into touch this whole idea of vapour permeability being the way that cold buildings breathe, um, which as I thought hopefully we've seen so far that that's nonsense. Um, if that wasn't enough to kick it into touch, a practical hook on this will be that um, anybody that's tried to dry wet clothes indoors with you know, on like an airing horse with the radiators on full whack, knows that it takes bloody ages, um, and it you just end up with this like damp, humid environment, but the clothes stay wet for ages. Whereas if you put them on the washing line for an hour when it's blowing a hooli, they get a good blow and dry right out. If you then for scientific research purposes, of course, um, notwithstanding drawing a few weird looks from your neighbours, decided to erect a Gore-Tex tent around the the clothesline uh, out in the garden, you would find that the so Gore-Tex, highly breathable in terms of vapour permeability, 
Um, now, I've got nothing against Gore-Tex. I buy their jackets. They're great. Um, you do sweat more in Gore-Tex than you do in open space. Um, and that's because it's windproof. Now, the wind shields the damp substrate from the favourable evaporation conditions, i.e. that wind blowing across the surface. So it starves it of that efficient evaporation condition. And so whilst it's there for permeability, it's windproof and it, it can't dry. And lo and behold, wet clothes, or in the case of buildings, wet build. Fact number three, not only does Harlan help dry the masonry out, it keeps up it keeps it drier for longer during periods of wind driven rain. Right. So the whole business of the capillary effect capillary drying, um, this is where we really get into poultice mechanics here. So a fine poured sub um material when it's in in, in intimate contact with a coarse poured material. You chuck a bucket of water on that and you'll notice that the fine poured material sucks the water out of the coarse poured material um, and that's a process of capillary um, capillary affinity, capillary mechanics, okay? Now, so the fine poured material sucks the water out of the coarse poured material. The reverse is not true. So, um, if you had a coarse poured material on a fine poured substrate, the no advective drying would be done, you know, no capillary suction would be done. It would be a very slow process of diffusion. So that would be a useless poultice medium. Um, but where you've got a nice capillary active fine poured material on a damp coarse poured substrate, it is soaking the water out of the substrate when it, it when it um gets wet. But it also um, we, buildings take most of the moisture from the outside. Um, obviously, you've got internal moisture and rising damp and all the rest of it. But you know, broadly speaking, it's wind-driven rain that's the main water load on uh, on on buildings, other than vertical rainfall. So the stuff that's hitting the wall um, wets it from the outside in, and that capillary active fine poured harling will hold on to the water until it reaches 100% saturation. So that capillary affinity of the fine poured coating does not want to let go of that water into the coarse poured substrate until it's got no other option but to, you know, um, it, it has com it's got no, no more poor volume for the, the water to go to. And even then, it's not going to advect and draw fast into the coarse poured substrate because obviously the fine poured material holds on to the water where it can relative to coarse pores. So then you're just into a very slow diffusion scenario. So that's why it keeps it drier for longer because it's holding the water out at the front. And remember, when the rain stops but the wind keeps blowing, it's drying right back out and all that water is right at the outer surface of the building, ready to evaporate straight back into the outside. So it's um it's a really fascinating process. Fact number four, lime washed surfaces, including lime harrowed surfaces, dry more effectively than the same substrate without lime wash. Right, okay, this is getting pretty mind boggling here, but it makes sense when you sort of think down at the, the, the physical principles that we've been through so far. So the principal driver of wet, drying of wet stuff is wind speed across the surface. And that can be maximised by maximising the um, the surface area. Okay, so when you think of what Harlan is, Harlan's a wonder material. But when you lime wash that Harlan, you further enhance its ability to um, weatherproof the building. So what is Harlan? Harlan's a mortar that's harled at the wall. What is a mortar? A binder and aggregate. Okay. It's the binder, the lime binder, that's the microporous spongy bit. Okay, that's responsible for its functionality and drying or grappling with water and all the rest of it. The the aggregate is essentially filler. Um, so I'd say for talking to it, it's a it's a quartz aggregate. It's, you know, a, a gritty sand or, or so, non-porous. That's just filler. Okay, so it dilutes the mm, capillary active spongy bit. Whereas if you then lime wash that. And lime wash is essentially 
just pure microporous sponge um, that's applied on and you know it's a thick liquid like sort of thinned greek yogurt state um that then you know dries stiffens carbonates and sets up that optimal poor um poor microstructure for soaking all that water out intimately coating all the aggregate and essentially um you know extrapolating the the capillary active surface area at the drying front and lo and behold it's soaking all that water out your wall and um, making the best use of evaporation conditions okay back number five now whether harold lime washed or harold and lime washed traditional hot mix lime finishes are grappling with moisture and sacrificially protecting the masonry substrate in the process so this is the real holy grail of masonry conservation here it's the sacrificial weathering phenomenon unique to historic lime mortars okay now how that works is so it's entirely down to the poultice mechanics again so you've got your fine poured capillary active lime coating soaking the water out of the damp coarse poured substrate and in doing so that the, the pulling the water um in the liquid phase into itself it is moving soluble salt ions that are dissolved um in that water in that moving water and it's a very very effective desalination technique there's the whole business of like the read up on the science of poulticing it's fascinating um but those move so that moving water which is mobilized by wetting and drying cycles we're talking several times a day in some parts of scotland 365 days of the year right over the lengthy lifetimes of traditional masonry buildings you have incredibly pronounced salt management process here so moving water washing out the soluble salts confining the harmful evaporation front which is where that soluble salt then precipitates creates little crystalline ne needles that stab the pore walls breaking down that matrix um and causing this damage that's in once that's drawn away from the substrate into the lime surface coating that's then in the sacrificial medium which can be maintained or repaired or even replaced uh, as and when required over the lengthy lifetime of these buildings it's an incredibly pronounced it's essentially a shelter coat um so this is lime harling is really the prime culmination of poulticing principles okay now understanding um how all that works is good and well but like i said it's an academic point unless we can bring that information to bear in a specification context okay that's what we're going to look at so capillary activity is at the heart of lime harling's ability to draw water out of the building and to preserve the fabric in the process and what what is responsible behind so we've seen that it's the microstructure that um is essentially the pore size distribution the pore volume its interconnectivity um what establishes that microstructure is really interesting so when you look at harlan or, or traditional lime mortar on a fine enough scale through a powerful enough microscope you'll see it looks like you, you feel like you're wasting your money on the microscope because it essentially looks like the same thing it's a 3d microporous sponge um, so it looks like harlan it's just at ten thousand times or something um now that that sponge is responsible for obviously that that's um the microstructure but what causes that sponge to develop in the first place it's the mineral calcite um you know essentially it's such chalk calcite carbonated free lime in the fresh mortar mix or uncombined lime in the, the you know in the mortar possibly via the aggregate depending on what you're doing okay so that microporous sponge is the bit that's soaking the water out the wall and with the moving water come the soluble salts that um we are now equipped having identified what the mineral behind this business is we are now equipped to take that 
um, and go into a specification context, okay? So we know the mixed constituent that's causing all the functional behaviour. So, and now there's lime and there's lime, okay? We're talking about the latter here. Now, when I refer to traditional hot mix lime mortars or traditional historic lime mortars, it's the the functional um, the calcite is carbonated free lime, so that comes from fat, air, non-hydraulic or very feebly hydraulic limes, which sets up that optimal microstructure, which do is is doing all the spongy stuff. Okay, so. Um, and now the overwhelming majority of traditional lime mortars for buildings in UK structures is non to feebly hydraulic in, in the sort of hydraulicity spectrum. So we're talking incredibly lime rich, binder rich mixes. So in order for us to be technically compatible, our conservation mortar needs to match the the mixed constituents which sets up the physical chemistry which creates that um, functionality that we've seen. So there's in terms of specification there's two considerations here. There's a binder type consideration and a binder amount consideration. So binder type, we need to be starting at the air lime end of the spectrum and then maybe making it just hydraulic enough practical setting conditions whether it's through a porcelain or whether it's through gauging with NHL and but we also need to think about the binder amount issue because both the binder type and the binder amount lead to the total volume of uh, free lime or uncombined lime in the fresh mortar mix and it's that that needs to carbonate to set up that optimal microstructure okay these things are most practically achieved by using quick lime, um, hot mixing with quick lime mortars. Whether it's used hot or used cold, I don't really have much um, more to say on. Uh, the masons far prefer to use it hot for, for very good reasons, um, especially when it's cold. But um, what you get with a quick lime based mortar is a technically compatible and objectively correct conservation mortar um, and ultimately it's the most faithful replication of what was there before and the pleasure to use which invites the question how breathable is breathable Re really what have we been doing with NHL mortars you know so comparing an air lime with an NHL um, in vapor permeability terms which I said for me is essentially meaningless but there, there, there's a there's a Distinct difference here, the permeability of the air lime is significantly larger than NHL. Um, but it's the capillarity, like I said, is the, the really important bit. And we're talking, you know, air lime several times greater, that's several hundred percent more capillary active than your standard NHL. Uh, your, your natural hydraulic lime mortar, you know, NHL 3.5 or whatever. Um, you know, your, your air lime's so much more capillary active than that. So um, it, it invites the question, look, at what point did we decide that NHLs were breathable? Uh, the only objective compatibility credentials here um, are the ones taken from the historic example. So if we want to be serious about a technically compatible conservation mortar, we need to take those credentials from the historic example, not impose what we think it should be on, you know, that physical history we're dealing with. Um, so we can't just examine an NHL and decide, okay, well, that will be breathable and we'll score everything else by this. We need to measure these things against the historic example, okay? Now, hopefully I've uh, got the point across that vapour permeability is a terrible way of describing breathability. I'm not sure if that point got through at all. But, uh, right, this is the thing that really gets on my goat more than anything at the moment, is the whole carry on about these specialist materials um, marketing. I thought the days of chemical damp proof courses had died a death, but they've just cropped up in a different form. Um, in so-called stone sealant treatments 
another impregnation paint on treatment to you know waterproof stone masonry and um proprietary lime mortars that uh, whether they're used for pointing indent work or surface coatings the it's infuriatingly they're called lime mortars the marketed as lime mortars well, what they don't disclose is that they've got chemical admixtures in them, which fundamentally ruin their functional behaviour. Uh, the popular um, admixture is an airing training agent um, and the water retaining agents. The outworking of these is that it changes the surface chemistry of the mortar from wettable to hydrophobic, and that entirely prohibits any capillary drying that can be done through that material so instead of a poultice essentially you've got a plug that's smothering the surface and yes it is smothering the surface because like i said whether it's vapor open it is beside the point vapor permeability does not describe how wet stuff dries so looking at this analogy here what we've got is we've got our pore cross set uh, porous material cross-section from earlier with the water vapour adhering to the wall, joining that film, scooting along the film. And then as it gets to the front of the queue, it realises that some clown has put a Gore-Tex tent around the family washing. And what that, what the, the molecules at the front of that queue have to raise sufficient free energy, which doesn't like to do, costs it time and effort, to break away from the molecular cohesion to the next water molecule and adhesion to the porous solid and then diffuse through that vapour open capillary closed material in the vapour phase which as I said there is barely any imperative to do and it takes absolutely forever so like I said erect an agortex tent around your, uh, your washing um, leads to wet washing and in the case of buildings damp masonry and the thing that so it makes me so angry about this was because it looks like lime mortar when it's in the wall so it's difficult to see where there's fundamental incompatibilities and technical compatibility is not some airy fairy you know academic point this is what causes accelerated decay of you know heritage masonry that's physical history we're dealing with and in terms of the displacement of the drying front and by inference the destruction to the salt um, precipitation patterns in the masonry fabric this is more damaging than the notorious cement mortars we've been taking out the wall for the last 30 years so you know we think we're being clever by hockling about with the chemistry of these materials and we're fundamentally missing the point. Any material which boasts high vapour permeability alongside low capillarity should be thrown in the bin where it belongs. Okay. So I think I've done this to death. You might have got the point by now that breathability is terribly described by vapour permeability. So please let's stop talking about it, okay? Remember this wee angry teacher. Um, just as a wee throw in here, we've got um, an example of a job I've just finished. Um, we're doing some serious structural repairs to this dodgy chancel. Um, essentially rebuilt this masonry arch, which was very, very unhappy. Um, buckling, tracery and all the rest of it. it was all put right. And so we dealt with the structural business and then um, conserved this uh, chancel. Um, which and you can see from the cement that's uh, we're working you know it's a, it, this is a phased uh, approach you can just see visually the massive difference and um you know the dark moldy dampness of the cement versus the bright um you know warm looking uh harold bit it just looks right you know um and it dries up so quickly once that nasty um cement removed okay so, um, in summary, um, I want to leave you with a wee analogy that I do like. Okay, so 
What makes lime Harlan, um, and particularly what makes lime washed lime Harlan, the prime culmination of capillary drying mechanics and voltage principles? Um, now, uh, the analogy that I want to leave you with uh, concerns the, you know, specification of the conservation mortar. And my argument is it, it's just a, it's a simple question of home baking, right? So the analogy is my granny's cake. So if you wanted to make your granny's cake, God bless her, and you wanted to get the same result she did, how would you go about doing it? You would Well, for starters, you would use her recipe, you'd use the same ingredients, and you'd make it the same way. The specification and use of lime mortar is no different. If we use the right ingredients at the right mixed proportions and make it the same way, for all intents and purposes, we'll get the same result our forefathers did back in the day. And what that result is, is a highly efficient um, dryer out of wet things. Um, so that's a, a real permanent poultice um, great for soaking the water out the wall and with the moving water come the soluble salt, conserving it in the process. Okay, so in summary, started off by looking at some basic definitions of Harlan, what are we dealing with? We then looked at five fun facts about Harlan and we explained them away with the how it works section and um, we then took that how it works knowledge and brought it to bear in a, in a practical specification context by bearing down on what it is that gives it that functionality in the first place. And it's the carbonated free lime or the uncombined lime in the mortar that causes all that microporous spongy business. Okay, now I said I would give references and I shall. So here are here is the further light nighttime reading for you. To read up. Um, I am happy to take questions. Uh, I'll leave my email address and thank you for listening.